Good. Thank you. Um, so it's my great, great pleasure to introduce Ms. McCarthy to join us today a uh, seminar on the European out, out and plate tectonics, the rock, the rock relationship. And before I, uh, before I hand over, I should let you know that Anders got his PhD in 2016 at the University of Lausanne uh, in, uh, in Switzerland, for those of you who don't, don't know, um, on the formation of orbicular granites in the Sierra Nevada, California. Yeah. And that, that was with Otmar Muntner. And then he postdocs um, at the University of Bristol, which was from, from 2017 to 2020, and uh, a really short stint at the University of Tasmania, um, which was six, six months. Um, and we was hoping to just hear for a meeting um, <clears throat> at, here at RS, RSES for a meeting that I held a little while ago and had to, and had to just virtually from Tasmania because of the, the, the lockdown that happened there. And uh, we, had, we had hoped that, um, before returning to Europe, Europe he'd be able to come here in person, but here we are again with a virtual seminar. seminar. Um, so in fact, uh, actor Anders is just from, from Paris today, where he's going to be, be until the middle of the year, I think, and then starting a four-year four uh, fellowship at uh, uh, Zurich. So that's, that's uh, enough for me. I'll, I'll pass to you and we'll hear about the, the uh, uh, European and plate tectonics. Thank you very much. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, usually I start by saying it's nice to be here, but... <laughs> um, so today I'm going to... So, so this project has been going on for quite a few years and it's in collaboration with quite a few people uh, around, uh, around the world. Uh, and, our, and what we've been doing is looking at the Alps, uh, um, uh, trying to um, look at the Alps from a new perspective. Uh, so what I'm going to do today, I'm going to give you a sort of broad overview of the Alps and some of the problems in terms of uh, uh, interpretations or models of how the Alps were formed. Uh, let's see how, uh, okay. ah, there we go, okay. Um, so, so we're going to be focused, uh, uh, can, can you guys see my mouse actually? Or, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Um, and so, so we're going to be focused on the European Alps right here, but also uh, in part on the sort of the little brother, which are the Pyrenees that formed around the same time, but are much smaller in scale. Uh, and we'll compare uh, the Alps or a few characteristics of the Alps to uh, other regions in the world shortly on uh, uh, Neotethys uh, ophiolites that are find, found here. Uh, we'll also just do a quick stint to the Izubonin arc. Uh, and also uh, the Australian Antarctic uh, Ocean Continent transitions and ultra slow spreading systems, just to to com to show to compare what's comparable between the Alps and other systems in the world, and to to show that it's quite a particular environment. Um, so to go back, uh, to go quite a ways back in time, um, in terms of alpine geology, a hundred years ago, uh, alpine geologists uh, had uh, uh, already solved quite a few problems. Uh, well, solved. Uh, they already had a, a nice, uh, some nice interesting ideas. It began with Otto Ampfer in 1911, um, who developed the first conceptual idea of what would be known as Ampfer type subduction, basically uh, by looking at uh, uh, retro deforming the Alps, for example. Um, it turns out that there was a piece of continental lithosphere missing. So that's his idea uh, in German of Verschluckung, so uh, swallowing basically of continental crust. So the first idea of down sucking or down thrusting of continental lithosphere uh, to great depth. Uh, and around the same time, uh, Gustav Steinmann in 1905 uh, defined what would be known as ophiolites. So that's uh, known as the Steinmann Trinity. It's basically the association of serpentinites, uh, basalts, and uh, deep sea sediments, the radial area that together form uh, this, the basic uh, structure of ocean crust. Um, so the adult actually already quite uh, uh, a good, they had all the tools at their disposal to understand or develop uh, a sort of uh, plate tectonic view of the world, but that didn't happen. And part has to do with the more uh, sort of the cautious outlook of these uh, geologists at the time. For example, uh, Arthur Achard said that it is better to doubt than to err. And so these, um, the Alps actually did not play really a role in the, the development of uh, a plate tectonic view of the world. And this framework came about by uh, geophysicists uh, who were able to map 
the Wadadi, what would be known for the future, uh, in the future as the Wadadi Benioff zone along convergent margins and the seismicity of the down going slabs, um, but also uh, mapping uh, the mid ocean ridges forming uh, uh, in uh, oceanic environments. And, uh, and further, uh, a little bit later in 1983, for example, the understanding that the down, that uh, uh, dense uh, oceanic lithosphere plays an important role uh, in, the, in, in, uh, uh, in subduction, but also in the formation of mid ocean ridges. So the idea of the mechanism of slab pull, whereby um, the age of the lithosphere is a coral is is, uh, uh, is um, how do you say the older the age of the lithosphere is the faster the rate of plate motion is and thereby there's this uh, mechanism that the oceanic lithosphere is really the, the engine of, of, of plate tectonics and so uh, with that the idea that subduction of ocean crust is the key uh, took hold and the idea of any kind of large scale or continental subduction uh, is eventually discarded and so this, this idea, this, this, this large scale uh, sort of rigid ocean crust that is subducting and controlling the dynamics of, of, of origins or continental, uh, yeah, continental uh, collisions uh, has been applied directly to the Alps in the last 30 or 40 years. And there is a lot of evidence for that, right? So we have arc magnetism. If you go to the center of the Alps, you have the beautiful Adamello uh, Pluton. And uh, it has compositions exactly similar to uh, arc magnetism or, or plutons in the Sierra Nevada, for example. Um, and you also have uh, geophysical image, uh, imaging of an ongoing slab. If you take a transect here uh, in Europe, you can see in the bottom, you can see this nice alpine slab that is subducted here. And it's quite a short slab that down, goes down to 200 or 300 kilometers. Uh, it all depends on which uh, paper you read. Sometimes it's shorter, sometimes it's longer. And there's this large anomaly at around 500 or 600, 600 kilometers depth, which is typically uh, associated with the subducting slab. And so this is typically thought of as a slab breakoff moment, which separates part of the European slab from, the, from another uh, section of it. And we also know that we had ocean crust in the Alps, right? So ophiolites, uh, which were uh, mapped out by Steinmann. And this is an example of one in the Western Alps in France, where you have a nice preserved large uh, gabbro core complex uh, with some ultramafic rocks. Um, and some of these uh, ophiolites were then subducted uh, down to 3 GPA and then were exhumed to shallow depths. And so all this, uh, all these uh, sort of evidences were, have been used to really define a nice coherent framework or plate tectonic framework for how the Alps formed. And so the, the classical view of the Alps is that at around 100 million years, uh, you had a uh, European margin, and then you, which was separated from a North African or Adria margin by an ocean, which is approximately a thousand kilometers in length. Uh, the width varies, as we'll see. And this ocean is a Jurassic, Jurassic ocean that formed, uh, that formed around 160 million years ago. Uh, some argue up until 100 million years ago. That's uh, quite debated. Uh, and around 100 million years ago, or 85 to 100 million years ago, subduction initiation occurred along uh, the passive margin of Adria, and then you had a foundering and subduction and complete destruction of the oceanic lithosphere, and that led to continental collision. And around 35 million years, um, due to the small geophysically imaged slab and small uh, plutons formed upon collision, there's typically the idea of a large slab breakoff event that occurred. So this kind of view of the Alps uh, can also be, uh, um, also influences other areas of, our, of, of what, how we think the Alps formed, for example, uh, the collisional, collisional magnetism and also the evolution of the orogeny. Uh, for example, in Kisling and Schluniger in 2018, they really discuss how this large uh, slab breakoff event has strongly influenced the topography, but also the formation of uh, collisional magnetism. And, and this is also applied to other origins uh, in other uh, environments. Um, but also, uh, because we know that there was this fossil subduction, we can also use uh, the slab interface in the Alps uh, to look at the dynamics of subduction. And if you have a large scale oceanic subduction, then you can look at the sort of melange or the interface between the downgoing slab and the, uh, and the upper uh, 
continental lithosphere here or the mantle wedge section and look at all the dynamics of uh, melange mixing and fluids, de fluid dehydration that might drive uh, arc magmatism in this case or the formation of these serpentinite wedge diatheres and etc. So, so the Alps in this kind of environment can be used to really trace um, modern day subduction processes occurring at convergent margins uh, worldwide. And so this view of the Alps implies that this is a nice typical oceanic Benioff type subduction where you destroyed up to 95% of your ocean crust and 50 to 70% of your oceanic sediments. Basically you had your wide ocean and you don't have a lot of it preserved in the Alps. Everything was subducted prior to collision. And so the complex, a lot of complex alpine structures you can see in the field, um, complex associ associations of oceanic sediments, continental crust, and then serpentinites in there are typically or could be attributed to subduction melanges or compressional tectonics that have uh, led to these uh, complex structures. And so, so the idea of this model of the Alps, which is uh, typically accepted, is that there was an efficient subduction of hydrated ocean crust before continental collision. And so the, the uh, typical mechanisms that we have in large-scale subduction zones and, uh, for example, subduction of the Pacific lithosphere, Pacific Ocean crust, um, is basically that slab pull and slab rollback and slab breakoffs play a crucial role in the evolution of the Alps. But there's a, there's a, there's a <clears throat> relatively important paradox, and, and it's been a sort of a hidden secret for alpine geologists for quite a long time, the problem of magmatism in the Alps, but it's not something that uh, we usually talk, uh, talk about. So if you have the subduction of oceanic lithosphere, you basically are subducting into the convective upper mantle uh, hydrated ocean crust that's been altered by seawater. You have water in the sediments, you have water in your altered uh, basaltic section of your ocean crust, and you also have water in your, in your oceanic mantle, right? Your prototypes that have been transformed to serpentinite. And, and as the subduction, and as, uh, as your hydrate ocean crust then subducts into the mantle, you're basically going to have dehydration of all those different sections of your ocean crust at different uh, pressures and temperatures. And that's going to flush your mantle wedge with a lot of water and you're going to drive arc magnetism. And basically, this is an example, for example, of the large Sierra Nevada vapolith. Um, that subduction of oceanic lithosphere will invariably um, drive arc magnetism. And that's the case for uh, magmatism in any convergent setting, even though you can have some small, some uh, uh, sort of, uh, in certain cases, you can have some uh, small local collisions or uh, uh, flat slabs that might prevent magmatism from occurring. Magmatism is in the course of a subduction uh, going to happen. But this is very interesting is that in the Alps, we do have uh, some illustrations. This is the on the right of my screen, this is a model from Stampley, 1998, um, who shows the subduction of a thousand kilometer wide oceanic lithosphere a slab in the Alps, and then here a second small slab. Uh, this is one interesting thing of the Alps. Uh, typically, there's one large slab, but other people have suggested there's a second or a third one because of small microcontinents. Um, but anyway, the interesting thing is, is that there is a large slab that's subducted with a slab rollback mechanism, but the models never show uh, arc magmatism occurring because it's not. And this is a big problem. And the only one of the reasons why there is a slab breakoff uh, upon collision is in part because suddenly you have these small uh, magmatic intrusions in the Alps. So by using a slab breakoff to explain magmatism, uh, they're actually showing that during the entire subduction of your ocean crust uh, for 50 million years or so, there's no evidence of magmatism. And so the question is why? Uh, let's see. Ah, there you go. Okay, so just to illustrate the problem of magmatism in the Alps, but also in the Pyrenees, which are a much a smaller system than the Alps, this is a map of uh, magmatism during convergence or uh, during the subdu subduction and collision in the Alps and Pyrenees. Uh, Pyrenees, for example, there's not a single dike or a volcano or anything. Uh, or any magnetism formed during convergence and collision. And in the Alps, there are a few plutons. Uh, there's the uh, Anamelo vapolith here, which is very nice. Uh, just so you know, the scale of this map is the same as the Sierra Nevada. So even though there's plutons, uh, it, it, they are extremely sparse. Uh, there are a few dikes here and there, uh, but you know, the, the scale of these plutons is extremely small. And that could be seen, um, this um, 
on on the right hand screen the, the volume of of, of um, magmatism in the alps and pyrenees compared to mid-ocean ridge systems and arc systems the pyrenees and the alps really well pyrenees is at zero and the alps are extremely limited in terms of volume or estimated volume uh, uh, compared to other systems so they are unique in that sense in terms of uh, convergence there is no magmatism during uh subduction and in the Alps there's only some magmatism during collision. So one of the arguments has always been that well maybe it was simply eroded. You have a long-lived subduction, you have everything's been eroded or subducted and it's it's uh, not necessarily a problem that you don't find any magmatism. So there's a way you can trace that, right? You can look at the tridal zircons. Uh, for example, this is a graph from Patterson and Decia from Elements Magazine in 2015 where they compare uh, the trial zircon populations. Uh, this is, for example, in the northern Andes, and this is in the southern Andes. They compared it to trial zircon population compared to the, sort of the magmatic uh, zircon population. And there is quite a good fit, right? And that's because when you have arc magmatism or any magmatism, for example, which contains zircons, which is the case of subduction zone systems, um, or in arc systems, I should say, um, you typically have eruption of your volcanic, uh, your formation of your volcanoes and then rapid erosion or, uh, and then deposition in uh, nearby basins. So your sediments are a very good tool to, to show what is happening and to, or a good record of what's happening uh, in your arc system. So you can do that in the Alps. You can look at the trial zircons in the Alps and the Pyrenees. Um, and it's, we, we didn't, uh, measure any zircons. We only compiled the literature. There's been a significant amount of literature in the last in the last 10 years on the trial zircons uh, in the area. Um, and so we've looked at, uh, so this is a graph you have on the, on the left. It's the, the trial zircon population in the European Alps uh, and the trial zircon population in the Pyrenees and sediments for the last, uh, I think it's 300 million years. And you can see that there's a clear, nice record of zircon ages down to at least a billion years ago. Uh, well, there are twice as many zircons in the Alps. And if we zoom in on the area of interest, the area of interest is really the last 300 million years. That's the entire cycle of, of you had rifting, you had ultra slow spreading, you formed your oceanic lithosphere, then you subduct, and then you have your collision. And that can be seen by the different colors in this graph. So this y, uh, X axis is the last 300 million years. The gray is the timing of rifting. The red here is the timing of a mid-ocean ridge spreading. Or, um, uh, so in the Alps, it's more more spreading. In uh, Pyrenees, it's a little more alkaline. Um, and then you have in green, um, the initiation of uh, subduction. So subduction initiation, the beginning of convergence of these systems. And in the Alps in particular, in blue, that's the prograde to high pressure subduction metamorphism, which in the Pyrenees does not exist. There's no metamorphism during subduction or uh, convergence. And then in the red, uh, that is, or orange, this is your time, timing of collision. And if you'll note something is that zircons, both in the Pyrenees and the Alps, they stopped around oof, 200 million years or something. There's no zircons uh, recorded from subduction initiation until collision. Uh, that's notably the case in the Pyrenees uh, and, and the Alps. The only peak here is related to these small intrusions. Uh, um, so what's particularly striking is that you have no detrital zircons that are between 100 million years when subduction was initiated down to about 45 million years where we know we have some plutons. And along all the uh, sediments that we find during convergence in the Alps and oceanic sediments and the fleece and everything, there is actually no volcanic plastic material. So basically, um, there is no arc and there was no arc between 100 million years and around 50 million years. So the time of subduction of your entire oceanic lithosphere, which is a problem. And so let's see, I can't see my whole slide. There we go. Okay, oh yes. So. What this implies is that if you do not have any magmatism, then you do not uh, drive magmatism to occur. And if you're in a convergent margin, this implies that you did not bring enough water down into your mantle, which implies that your sediments, your oceanic sediments and your serpentinites were not uh, subducted. So, so maybe, or not subducted to great depth, I should say. So, so what if? What if we, we go back to the drawing board and we say, well, 
What if this is not a typical Benioff oceanic subduction, right? What if this is a system that formed Alps is not the same as a typical oceanic subduction in another uh, in, in, in uh, modern day environments, let's say, uh, in large oceanic settings? Uh, what if the drivers are not slab buoyancy and slab rollback? What if there's potentially no slab break off, right? What if this this anomaly we see here in the down go in, in this, this, this European al or alpine slab, which is about here. Uh, what if it's not at all related to this large anomaly, right? Or maybe that's the size of the slab as it was when it's abducted. Um, and what if it isn't really a mature ocean crust that's subducted there? So we can ask ourselves the question, what is the nature of the subducted material, right? We can look at what, 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 what kind of ocean crust was there before subduction, and two, what is the size of the subductible domain? Because I said up to a thousand kilometers of ocean crust was subducted, um, and those were for uh, models between uh, 1998 and 2014, for example, but the size of the Alpine Tethys, or Western Tethys, if you like, um, was relatively uh, narrower. So that's what we're gonna try and answer for these next uh, 20 minutes or so as what is the nature of the subducted material and what is the size of the domain that was subducted. So first of all, if we look at, uh, this is a uh, few plates model. This is uh, Michael Neergarten, who's a colleague in Paris, who just uh, sent me this. This is uh, according to some of these new um, uh, reconstructions, um, but it, they don't actually vary a lot uh, depending on different models you use, is that this is at 130 million years, you have France here, you have uh, the Alpine Tethys here, you have Iberia here and what is going to be the Pyrenees here, and you have, you have greater Adria, right? So, so this is the Alpine Tethys more or less at its widest extent. Uh, in comparison, you have the Central Atlantic here, you have the Southern North Atlantic that's gonna start to open up, and you have to the East, the Neo Tethys. So the first thing you can see is that it's difficult to compare the Alpine Tethys or, or the Western Tethys, uh, it has a variety of names. Um, it's hard to see it as comparable to anything else going on in the region at the same time. So in the Neo Tethys, we look at large scale interoceanic subduction systems uh, and oceans opening and oceans closing. In the Alps, it's a relatively narrow, small uh, ocean. And even though some uh, papers suggest there's a thousand kilometer maximum ocean cross subducting, well, it, this is a very narrow environment, right? So this is a scale of around 200 kilometers. So there is some space, but there is not a lot of space. And depending on which uh, 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 estimates you use, there's a maximum, maximum of 500 to maximum 700 kilometer wide area. This is relatively smaller than this estimate, but let's be generous. Let's say there's 500 kilometer to 700 kilometer wide area where you could fit an ocean crust. But the question is, is that space right here filled with just pure steady state ocean crust? So what do we mean when we say there's this space available for that? So the first thing you can do, you can look at beautiful outcrops in the Alps. Um, so if you look in, the, if you go to the central, uh, central Alps or Eastern Switzerland, there's some very nice outcrops of undeformed ophiolites. And these ophiolites are basically passive margins. They're not ophiolites typical of the Neotethys, which are super subduction zone ophiolites, uh, these alpine ophiolites are relatively unique. Um, and if you simply look at this, uh, this uh, transect here, um, you can see the illustration of it to the right. This is a sort of a, a geological a map of showing the, or map or transect showing the, uh, that there is continental crust that is thinning out and you have exhumed mantle that, well, mantle that is being exhumed to the seafloor and then you have post-drift sediments that are locking everything in place. So uh, there is quite a few ophiolites in the Alps that are um, not simply uh, peridotites and sediments and gabbros and basalts, but they're directly related to, um, to a continental crust that is being thinned out. And this is an illustration you have on the bottom right of what the uh, Adriatic margin uh, looked like in the Alps. Uh, following Jurassic uh, rifting and spreading. And basically you have your continental sphere that is rapidly thinning out towards the ocean. And then you have you know, a significant amount of subcontinental mantle that is thinned out and exhumed to the sea floor. And that's what we have in a lot of these uh, ophiolites in the Alps. And this is fundamentally different from 
what's typically known known as an ophiolite, which is this Penrose uh, type of ophiolite, uh, where you typically have Hartsburgites, and then you have layered gabbros and uh, isotropic gabbros or upper gabbros, and you have large sheetedite complexes and pillow lavas. And the Alps ophiolites are dominated by exhumed mantle that's been serpentinized and thinned out continental crust or an environment which is very close to the continental margin. Um, but that's by no means unique. And there I'm shamelessly making some publicity for my recent paper, even though I could have quoted other uh, authors who've done a lot of work in the area. For example, Gilles Arretal in 2016. Um, uh, this is along the Australia Antarctic margin. And what, um, what we can see along the margin by, by combining a seismic uh, interpretation of seismic transects along the Antarctic margin um, and by looking at dredge samples of the ocean continent transition zone is that there's a large environment of thin continental crust, right? This is towards the continent toward the left. Um, oh, this is this uh, red, uh, one of these red uh, profiles here. So, so you have thinned out continental crust and then you're exhuming your subcontinent mantle uh, to the sea floor. And this can be, uh, this can occur <clears throat> over uh, quite a wide uh, distance, right? 50 to 100 kilometers or so, or even more. Uh, so a certain, certain amount of your extension during rifting is really dominated by thinning out of continental crust and exhumation of subcontinental mantle. And this is also the case, this is another example um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, along the Iberian margin. So this is Spain and this is Portugal. And here along the transition from the continent towards the ocean, again, what do you see? You see that you had thick continental lithosphere that rapidly thins out, um, transitioning towards exhumed mantle. And you have these large continental blocks which are separated from the continental margin by exhumed mantle. So, so the transition from the continent towards the ocean can be a highly uh, complex uh, environment. This is, for example, illustrated by all these uh, ODP drill sites that were drilled along the margin, and you could drill a uh, continental crust and then suddenly exhume mantle and, and gabbros. So, so the transition can be complex, and it does, you don't typically transition from a continental crust rapidly towards uh, a mature steady state ocean crust um, uh, in ultra slow or slow rifting or spreading systems. So a large part of um, the, the, the extension in the Alps uh, and the Pyrenees is dominated th simply by hyper thinning or hyper extension of continental lithosphere and exhumation of, of your mantle. Um, but there is some evidence of ultra slow spreading, let's be honest. Uh, we have mid ocean rich basalts uh, spread out a little everywhere in the Alps, and they're all dated in a sort of 10 million year window nearly, um, at around 150 to 165 million years, nothing else. Well, a few here and there, but it's extremely, um, um, some of the ages are controversial. And if you, if you look at, you estimate the timing of uh, more magmatism, and you estimate an ultra slow spreading kind of environment, um, Paola Manzotti in 2014 suggested that there actually was only approximately 200 to 300 kilometers of ultra slow ocean crust that was that was formed. And this ocean crust, this is the uh, schematic illustration from uh, this uh, transect here from La Gabrielle um, that I showed you earlier. Basically, you have these large Gabroic core complexes. And these are fairly typical if you look at ultra slow spraying systems in the Atlantic, for example, where you have you have uh, it's, uh, gabbros, large gabbros, but then you also have an ocean crust that's dominated by exhumed mantle and a few sparse basalts. And that's what we see in the Alps. The Alps are dominated by mantle rocks, which are strongly heterogeneous. We'll get back to that in a second. And then a few basalts and a few large gabbros. And this again is, is not very different from what you see in ultra slow spreading systems. This is in the Southwest Indian Ridge, where ultra slow spreading is, is not um, accommodated by a nice uh, mid-ocean ridge where you have significant amount of magmatism. Um, what's happening is that exhumation of, of uh, is, or extension is, is controlled mainly by exhumation of, of mantle rocks to the sea floor and sort of a flip-flop kind of, of, of idea of large uh, peridotite uh, complexes just being exhumed uh, by large detachment faults. So extension in these cases is simply mantle being exhumed to the sea floor um, that these are the green uh, colors. That's the amount of dredged uh, periodotypes that were found everywhere. And there are only a few areas here where suddenly you can get to 
areas where you're extracting uh, your melt and you're forming more volcanic uh, uh, spreading systems. And so that's basically what we see in the Alps. In certain cases, you have, you're dominated massively by mantle rocks, which are slowly exhumed to the sea floor, likely uh, as sort of detachment uh, faults like this, and then maybe some sparse area where you can rapidly transition towards more sort of volcanic uh, kind of spreading. So the sense we get in the Alps is that from, the, from looking at the field, from looking at um, uh, the more mid-ocean rich basalts and gabbros is that a significant amount of your extension is dominated by thinning of your continental crust and then exhumation of all your sub cold subcontinental mantle to the sea floor and then a very short amount of mid-ocean ridge magmatism. And, and that's also reflected in the composition of your mantle rocks. In typical ophiolites uh, in the Southwest Pacific, for example, your periodotites are, ultra, are highly depleted. They formed in sub subduction zone environments. They're affected by subduction. In the case of the Alps, a lot of these ophiolites are simply cold, heterogeneous, inherited mantle uh, that's been affected by old processes. So for example, a significant amount of them are what's called spinel periodotites mixed in with pyroxenites and all these uh, whole bunch of uh, heterogeneous um, uh, features, which are related to old inherited uh, processes occurring uh, prior to um, uh, rifting and spreading. And so they are basically exhumed to the sea floor and they have cold temperatures and, and, and particular isotopic compositions. And there's a second type of periodotites in the Alps. Um, it's what you call more fertile plagioclase periodotites. So where your spinel mineral your, uh, has been replaced by plagioclase. So this is a thin section image, maybe a millimeter across, uh, maybe a little less. Um, I should have put a scale here, uh, where you can see that your mantle pyroxene here, this is a small clinopyroxene in your mantle, uh, of your mantle periodotite, has been completely resorbed uh, by a sort of intergrowth of what's plagioclase and orthopyroxene. So this is, a, this is a typical characteristic of melt percolating through your mantle. So, so by looking at the temperatures, for example, of these rocks, we see that they're much higher in temperature than the old inherited mantle we have. And so there's a superposition of two things happening to this mantle. One, you're exhuming cold inherited mantle to the sea floor, but you also have evidence of your asthenosphere that's rising up uh, and melting, and that then leading to percolation of mid ocean rich basalts to, uh, um, into your periodotite. So your periodotites are basically acting as a sort of sponge absorbing your melt. Um, and so that's what you get sort of with two distinct types of periodotites in the Alps, an old inherited one, and then one that's been uh, sort of replaced or reacted with melt percolation uh, during uh, rifting or transition from rifting to spreading in the Alps. But if we have a mid-ocean ridge, if we have an active mid-ocean ridge that produced nice basalts and nice gabbros, there's, nice, there's some evidence of ultra-slow spreading, we should also find periodotites that are exhumed at the sea floor at the mid-ocean ridge, which melted at 160 million years or 150 million years, right? We should find evidence of periodotites which were formed at this active spreading system. And again, it's, um, a lot of these rocks are serpentinized, but what we can do is we can, we can look at rocks or periodotites that have been affected only by partial melting and try and see when these periodotites actually melted in time. So how do you do this? This is the only geochemical plot I'm gonna show, uh, uh, so don't worry. Um, uh, so what you can do is you can look at the pyroxenes in your periodotites, and you can measure the isotopic composition of samarium and neodymium. So basically it acts like a clock. Um, you can, so what happens is that you have your, on the X axis here, you have your samarium to neodymium, neodymium ratio, and then over time, uh, your samarium basically breaks down into your 143 neodymium, okay? So what happens is that in, uh, typically, if you're in a mid-ocean ridge system, you have your asthenosphere, which has sort of this composition here. This is the red square. That's an assumption, obviously. You assume that things are relatively homogenous to a certain extent. Um, and then what happens is that if you're melting uh, your mantle um, during uh, mid-ocean ridge spreading, you're basically going to get an array of pyroxenes that have a composition along this line. Okay, so the samarium to neodymium ratio was influenced by melting. And so the higher the melting, 
uh, the higher this ratio will be, simply based on the compatibility or incompatibility of these elements in your pyroxene. So basically, if you're spreading, you should get a whole variety of peridotypes that have more or less melted along this line. And then with time, once you've cooled your system down, you have radiogenic ingrowth, samarium transformed to nodinium, and then you basically uh, evolve with time to higher uh, nodinium-143 to nodinium-144 ratio. So there's a clock. And basically, this line will evolve, will increase through time. And then in the end, if you have a certain amount of depleted periodotites or periodotites that have been only affected by melting, uh, which plot along a specific line, you can then calculate an age. Obviously, this assumes that initially you had a homogeneous mantle uh, or a homogeneous source before melting. But what's particularly interesting is that throughout the alpine being reacted by melt uh, percolation uh, during rifting or spreading, uh, or that they're not. In, oh. uh, can you all hear me? Uh, could you repeat again? Okay. Yeah, sorry. Okay, I, I, I saw my internet was apparently unstable. <laughs> Um, let me know if you can't hear me. Um, so, so what happens is that all these depleted peridotites actually have what's called a model um, a permian age of magnetism. There's no peridotites that have been that we know of that really clearly show um, uh, Jurassic age of melting. There are there are here some that plot along this line, but they're mainly affected also by melt percolation. Uh, so this is quite interesting. Um, and so what we see in the Alps, these ophelites melting is not necessarily related to mid-ocean ridge emplacement. There are actually a lot of ancient processes occurring. Uh, what is interesting is that this seems to be related to widespread Permian magmatism across Western Europe. So, so what, is, what does all this mean actually? So we can zoom back and say, okay, what do we know about the Western Tethys or the Alpine Tethys? What did it look like? And this is a, a paleogeographic reconstruction at around 110 million years. Uh, this is Europe, this is Iberia, and this is Adria. And this is basically the widest extent of this alpine tethys, or uh, here we've also put the name Piemo Liguria. Uh, there were different small sections, the Valle de Piemo Liguria, all these different names. Um, basically, there was not a real uh, oceanic environment. Uh, this was an ultra slow spreading system where you, uh, this is a transect on the bottom here, this is a transect from A, A here to, to, to this transect here. So basically you have continental lithosphere that is thinned out, you exhume some subcontinental mantle, uh, you've rifted off pieces of continental blocks uh, which are isolated from each other and then you're exhuming again subcontinental mantle before you transition to the other side of the margin. So, so the alpine uh, Tethys uh, uh, was basically a pinch and swell architecture of just thinned out continental lithosphere, a very sparse evidence of an active mid ocean ridge, which is slightly more probably important along the south southwestern uh, segment of it. And so there's not really any evidence of a large scale uh, or, or wide ocean or mature steady state ocean crust. And basically what we see is that in this environment, under continental crust, but then in, the, in these basins or hyperextended rift basins or whatever you want to call them, uh, there is a lot of hydrated mantle and there's a lot of oceanic sediments. And so these contain a lot of water and you would initially think that they should drive magmatism during subduction. So how does this impact subduction dynamic? We've seen that we don't have a large scale oceanic environment. We just have basically large rift systems uh, that have been in certain cases extended to the point where you started to have an ultra slow spreading mid ocean ridge system. So how can we look um, at uh, subduction processes or there are two things we need to look at. The first one is subduction initiation and the second one is a large scale subduction. So subduction initiation is quite interesting because we're getting more and more and more information about how it works, right? Um, and there are a few examples worldwide. The, uh, one, an interesting one is the Izubonen Mariana Arc system because that's been targeted in recent years by drilling. It's not the only uh, uh, example or, or there are obviously different ways in how this occurs. 
but they all seem to fit a similar pattern of significant amount of magmatism during subduction initiation. And these, a lot of these examples seem to occur in intraoceanic settings. So if you look at the Izubonin arc, uh, you have Japan right here, you have the modern day Izubonin arc and Mariana arc right here. But around 50 million years ago, uh, this system was right here along what's called the Kyushu Palau Ridge. And around 50 million years, you had subduction initiation, foundering of your oceanic lithosphere, and then several uh, incremental uh, back arc riftings uh, that occurred right here. And so you can target really the continent, the, the crust that's there, the ocean crust, uh, to really target what is happening during subduction initiation. And there have been a lot of uh, papers out in the recent years, uh, thanks to these three IDP expeditions that targeted the back arc or the rear arc or the fore arc. Um, and uh, well, I've shamelessly uh, put uh, a figure from one of my papers in review, but I've put, uh, put uh, a whole ar an other array of papers uh, in there. But some of uh, um, these drilling expeditions, including uh, what was site U1438, so it's a site which is basically uh, in just behind the arc, right here, just behind uh, in the back arc of the future um, uh, Izubonin arc, or here the uh, Kyushu Palau Ridge. Um, what we see is something particularly interesting is that the age of basalts we drilled are the age or slightly younger than subduction initiation prior to the transitioning into a mature arc stage. So combining all evidence in the Izubonin arc system, um, and this is just one very small example of it, um, subduction initiation seems to have been in an intraoceanic environment, potentially along a transform fault. In certain cases towards the north, there might've been a sort of uh, ancient arc. Um, and the foundering of your oceanic lithosphere produces a significant amount of upper plate extension. And this upper plate extension is accommodated by significant amount, a significant amount of upwelling and melting of your asthenosphere, leading to a sort of a proto-arc crust. So subduction initiation leads to extension of your upper plate and you're forming new ocean crust on which your arc will form. Okay, so this is a particularly interesting thing. Subduction initiation leads to a significant amount of magnetism. And that's the same for uh, intraoceanic subduction initiation events uh, along the Neotethys. I'm not going to go into the detail, but surprise, uh, suffice it to say that uh, along the Neotethys belt, you have a whole array of ophiolites uh, that span uh, from Albania all the way to the Himalayas. And a lot of them seem to share very similar uh, or overlapping characteristics and that they were formed during uh, a subduction initiation. And so you have your foundering of along a transform fault or a weak zone, you founder your oceanic lithosphere, and you form these ophiolites during subduction initiation along the upper plate. And they're affected by uh, different magmatic processes of potentially melting your, your subducted plate and dehydration, and, um, and then they're rapidly abducted. So these are fundamentally different ophiolites than we have in the Alps. And so, what happens from examples we can see in the Neotethys or in the Izubonin arc, subduction, subduction initiation, typically in intraoceanic settings, leads to upper plate extension, extensive and particular types of magmatism, and you're forming new ocean crust. And then you're either rapidly abducted, in the case of the Neotethys, you form your ocean crust and you abduct it, or you form a long-lived intraoceanic arc, like the Izubonin system. So what does subduction initiation look like in the Alps? Uh, we have some evidence, but because there is no magmatism, it's extremely hard to pinpoint exactly when a subduction took place. So to the right, you have the scale of subduction initiation along the Izubonin arc, um, and you started around 52 million years with depleted tholitic basalts, and you rapidly uh, transition towards bonanites, and then some kind of high magnesium andesites, and then you start to develop your island arc system. So within seven million years, you've transitioned from subduction initiation and upper plate extension towards a mature arc system. So these things happen extremely fast uh, and you, you can really map out this compositional variation or evolution in your magmatism that is produced during this evolution from simply upper plate extension to a long-lived arc system. In Alps, it's very different. So we know that we subducted along a passive margin and the reason for that uh, so this is an illustration of what likely happened. You have your thin continental crust and subduction likely started along this passive margin or the ocean continent transition. And it's typically complicated or difficult to subduct along a passive margin. 
Um, we know it likely happened there primarily because, and this is the timing of subduction initiation along the Alps, we know that uh, the first rocks to reach peak high pressure metamorphism uh, are continental blocks along the uh, Adriatic margin. So the first record we have of convergence are a, we have some turbidites that suggest compression started and you're starting to form a topography at around 90 to 100 million years ago. Then at around uh, uh, 70 to 80 million years ago, you start uh, having thrust faults all along the Adriatic margins that suggest uh, significant amounts of compression. And then you start to have peak metamorphism of continental fragments, right? And it's only later that you start having uh, metamorphism of your oceanic crust. Um, it's around D. Uh, you start potentially to have prograde, sort of initiation of subduction of continent of, of oceanic material at around 70 to maybe 80 million years. Uh, but then the peak metamorphism for oceanic crust is much younger. So this, so the conceptual framework analysis that subduction starts at the passive margin, uh, and you basically start to subduct continental fragments first. So is this realistic? So what we can do, we can look at a system that's way less deformed, just west of the Pyrenees. And you can look at the architecture of the, of the ocean continent transition, which we did before along the Iberia margin. So this is Spain, this is Pyrenees, and this is France. And you can look at the system when it's been slightly compressed. So we have two transects here along this domain, which was affected by compression. And what you can see is that through the interpretation of uh, uh, seismic uh, transects here. You have your thin continental crust and you're transitioning into a serpentinized exhumed mantle and then your, more, uh, your ocean crust. And what's interesting is that looking at interpretations, there seems to be some um, thrust faults uh, that are forming exactly at the transition between your thin continental crust and your exhumed mantle area. And it seems to be a relatively weak spot to accommodate convergence slightly increasing uh, convergence leads to the destruction of what we had before here, which was the hyperthin crust or exhumed mantle domain. And it's basically all been uh, compressed uh, into a uh, accretionary wedge and you're basically thrusting your uh, serpentinized or uh, ocean continent transition zone below the continental margin. So that could be seen um, as a, sort of the markers of the initiation of convergence or subduction uh, along a passive margin. So do we see the same thing in the Alps? There's a problem with the Alps is that a whole bunch of things have been stuck together and then you have a collisional origin. But if we go back to the central Alps where we have ocean continent transition zones or these ophiolites associated with continental crusts that are preserved, we can see some interesting features. So this is a map of one of those areas in the Alps, in the central Alps, where you have your continental crust, which is in gray and in uh, light brown or brownish gray. And in green, this is basically your, uh, your mantle rocks, right? Your ocean crust. And in darker colors, that's your upper plate. And in lower colors, that's your uh, uh, lighter colors, that's your lower uh, plate, your downgoing plate. So if we do a transect along this map, that's A to B, uh, this is what we see. We see a complex, uh, complex association of continental crust and ocean crust. And this large, uh, black line is basically the interface between your upper plate, which has not been affected by metamorphism, and you see a nice, your, 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 uh, your ocean continent transition zone, you have your mantle and exhumed mantle rocks, and you're transitioning towards your continental crust here. And below, you've basically stacked a whole array of different continental fragments, but also in, in uh, these light gray ones, but also oceanic rocks. And if you go onto the field and you, and you look at these things in detail, it turns out that this plate interface is not, is not really a one clear uh, plate interface where you've had a large scale subduction melange systems and downgoing uh, effects of, the, of this, um, uh, yeah, no subduction melange processes occurring. What happens is that if you reconstruct this Adriatic margin based on this, you have your thin continental crust and right at the transition between your thin continental crust and your exhumed mantle, you're basically forming this large shear zone. And then you're coherently imbricating large scale or large sections of your, your ocean crust uh, and you're down thrusting them. You're thrusting them incrementally one below or one over each other. And so you don't have a clear plate interface. And it also implies here that 
you're basically starting your subduction along your ocean continent transition. So from a numerical perspective, it's cool because it also works. And uh, we published this numerical model in 2020, thanks to Lorenzo Candiotti and University of Lausanne. Um, and you can do a numerical model which tries to mimic what happens in the Alps. The first stage, as you can see here, is you're basically hyperextending your continental crust. So you have hyperextension of your continental lithosphere, and then you have exhumation of your mantle to the sea floor, and you let it serpentinize, right? That's what happens uh, in the Alps. You have a whole bunch of serpentinites, a few kilometers thick. Um, and then the only way you can start subduction is not um, uh, by spontaneous subduction initiation or anything. You basically need to compress. And when you start to com compress or converge, and that's what happens in the Alps at around 100 uh, million years ago, you start convergence and you basically focus the initiation of subduction along your passive margin. And basically, it becomes a very weak zone, which we've seen uh, is the case along the, the Pyrenees and Iberia. And so what happens is that as you're focusing your subduction along the passive margin, you're shearing off all your hydrated lithologies. So the only thing that's really going down to significant depth is a dry mantle rocks, right? So you're shearing off all the top of your ultra slow spreading system. So your serpentinites, your sediments, you're also shearing off all your sort of your passive margin uh, structures and they're kept in the origin. And so the only thing going down to significant depths is basically your dry peridotites. Uh, and this here is simply the, the continuation of your serpentinites here is basically uh, a problem of the resolution of the model and a higher resolution model would, would make these things more or less disappear. So the significant proportion of your serpentinites in pink are basically, and sediments, oceanic sediments, are basically preserved in the origin and not subducted. So an alternative way of looking at the Alps is not that you had a wide ocean and that it was completely subducted or subducted and up to 95% of it was subducted and then you had slab break off processes, but you could see it as an environment where most of the rocks you see now are basically fully preserved from what happened during rifting and extension. And you could see the Alps more in terms of continental tectonics because we know we didn't have a long lived oceanic environment and there was a domain that was mainly dominated by hyperextension of continental sphere. So you could look at this simply as the Alps being formed by an ultra slow plate separation of continental crust exhumation of subcontinental mantle, and then forced ultra-slow plate compression. So if any uh, people are interested in the idea of continental tectonics, there is a paper by Molnar in 19, 1988, which is quite nice. So what happens is that what's subducted is mainly, uh, is mainly uh, your dry lithospheric mantle, which is small. It's basically a small passive slab that is going down. And most rocks or, or, or rock domains or passive margins, for example, are preserved both in the Alps and the Pyrenees. And this is an illustration of what happens. You have European margin here, you have your Adriatic margin here, you have large continental blocks in the middle. And when, when you're subducting, um, basically the internal zone of the Alps preserves the large portion of these, uh, of these uh, rift related uh, systems. So in the Alps and Pyrenees, basically, you could simply say, okay, they're actually simply, simply um, inverted rift basins. So you simply uh, had an inversion of rift basins that were formed during ultra slow extension. And that's something you can see. If we go back in the field, you can see a lot of areas in the Alps where there are complex associations of sediments and uh, serpentinites and continental crust and gabbros. This is a uh, image from Beltrando et al. 2014, um, where they looked at uh, one of the units in Alpine Corsica that went to high pressure. And you can see that you have in green serpentinites and associated with these serpentinites, you have deformed sediments and continental blocks and basalts. And it turns out that by studying the consistency of the lithostratigraphy architecture of, over large areas, you can look at the complex association of continental crust and serpentinites and basalts and different breccias and realize that these are not related to subduction menage or, or convergence really. Um, and they're already associated during rifting. In a lot of areas in the Alps, these ophiolites actually preserve rift-related or ultra-slow spreading ar architecture, where you had exhumed mantle, you had isolated continental blocks, which were separated from the continent by this exhumed mantle, and you have areas of uh, erupted basalts or gabbros. And so ophiolites in the Alps, although they seem complex, coherently preserve 
uh, their ancient rift of related history. And that's the same of passive margins. And this is one of the last slides I have. This is a paper from uh, uh, Pontet in 2020. It's a, a really, a really, really nice uh, piece of work. It just came out, so I can highly recommend it. Um, he looked at passive margins in the Alps. And it turns out there's an area called the Montfort Nap in Western Alps, where you can see a highly deformed area here, um, where you have your continental sphere and then these beautiful folds of sediments. And by looking at, uh, by really looking at the contacts, by looking at the whole evolution of the sediments in the area, it turns out this whole section is not necessarily completely deformed and, and, uh, and formed during convergence, but you can, well, it's deformed, but, but it turns out that this architecture is preserved from rift-related uh, inheritance. So these sediments, for example, the contact between the continental blocks and the sediments can be seen here. You have this thin section with quartzites, uh, which is the basement, so the continental crust here, and then on top of it, uh, this is a part of an overturned limb. Um, so these are the breccias that are formed during rifting, and the contact here is not a tectonic contact. So it seems that you're, even though you're highly deformed, you're preserving primary contacts, and by looking at all the sedimentary deposits and all these field structures in the field, it turns out that highly deformed complex areas of mixing of sediments and continental, uh, continental rocks are basically hyperextended passive margins during rifting. So not only are you preserving ocean crust in a coherent manner in the Alps, you're also preserving passive margins. And so what's important, and this is basically a summary slide, is that there might be two n-member types of subduction systems going on in the world, at least nowadays, probably way more before. Um, but you have a Benioff type and an Amphora type subduction. So the classical subduction we have and that operates all over most of the world in the Southwest Pacific as well, is that you have a wide oceanic domain with a steady state uh, mid-ocean ridge. And then the subduction of the system leads to a long-lived arc system and efficient subduction of your oceanic crust and your hydroid lithologies um, into the mantle. But the end member would be the Pyrenees. The Pyrenees are a very small system. You have only a very narrow environment of exhumed mantle. You have no mid-ocean ridge. You have no magmatism during subduction, no metamorphism. And basically, you're only rifting, you're, you're basically reactivating your rift system. And that could be really called more of an A-type or amphora-type subduction, because the only thing you're subducting is basically continental lithosphere. And the Alps would be more of an intermediate uh, thing, veering more towards amphora subduction, because you had hyperextension of your continental fragments, thinning out of your mantle, maybe some embryonic mid-ocean ridge here and there that was short-lived. And then subduction basically starts along the passive margin, and you're 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 making you have coherent imbrications of your 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 fragments here uh, into a uh, growing origin. But the only thing that is really subducting is your um, your uh, uh, downgoing dry peridotites. And so you don't have any arc system. You don't have uh, well, you don't have any arc system, but you're basically preserving a significant amount of rift-related structures in the Alps. So uh, I will have a very few short slides on some possible consequences um, of why this is important. Um, these might be possible or not possible. It's just to start a conversation and maybe uh, other people have different ideas. But if you look at the Alps from a typical plate tectonic perspective, you can look at uh, these uh, ultra high pressure rocks we have in the Alps that reach several GPA. And you can target exactly how fat, how deep they went before being exhumed. And if it's a problem sometimes to figure out exactly how these rocks were exhumed back, uh, back to shallow depths. And this is an illustration of you have your subducted oceanic crust, and you have your metamorphic rocks that are likely that could potentially be exhumed back in the subduction channels, typically along uh, normal convergent margins in the Pacific. Um, and in the Alps, we have uh, examples of rocks that reached easily three GPA. And this is relatively high pressure. So, so the question is, and that's something that's been uh, uh, targeted recently, is to what extent do pressure estimates uh, in these kinds of systems actually directly relate to depth? The possibility is yes, it's possible. You have your peak rocks that have three GPA, and that's the depth at which they were subducted. But it's also possible that you, we um, are not necessarily recording uh, typical lithostatic pressure, but there's possible, uh, there's a possibility that 
what we might be also recording is a significant amount of overpressure. And there is an interesting um, paper that came out by Louis et al. in 2019 in the Nature Communications. They were studying uh, in the Alps what's called the white schists uh, in metagranites in the Monte Rosa area. So these, these um, uh, bodies actually have much higher or record higher pressures than the surrounding metagranite. And they wanted to figure out really why. And it turns out that there's, they've made some nice numerical models uh, combined with field work and thin section work and isotope work. Um, and it turns out that uh, the heterogeneous structure of your granite with these granites uh, and, and between these, these sort of white schists or altered, hydrothermally altered granites, turns out that under, uh, they can lead to a significant variation in recorded pressures. And you can have up to 0.8 GPA of dynamic stress or uh, deviating from the lithostatic pressure in these systems. So there's a possibility that some of the ultra high pressure rocks we have in the Alps uh, are not necessarily related to peak subduction metamorphism typical of uh, systems we have where it went to high pressure and then it was exhumed. But it could very well be that you're monitoring heterogeneous pressure variations within a growing alpine wedge. So I think that's an interesting idea that has to be looked at further. To what extent is overpressure important uh, uh, in our systems? And the last one uh, is that in the 1990s, there was Davidson von Blackenberg, for example, that developed the idea of slab breakoffs in the Alps, and it's been used uh, quite, uh, quite a number of uh, other examples. And I'd like just to, to state that it's, it, it's um, before using the Alps as an example for slab breakoff models, um, there's, uh, it's been used because uh, of collisional magnetism, but also the fact that there's a small image slab at depth. But it turns out that the timing and location of the slab breakoff is largely unconstrained. Um, this is a paper from Garzanti et al, where they show a map of the Alps and where there are different uh, slab, uh, sort of slab windows. And it turns out that different papers have different ideas for the presence or absence of a continuous slab below the Alps. You have Lippic et al that say that there's a slab breakoff to the west in the Western Alps, and then Pia Piromalo, and who says there is a slab break off in the eastern part of the Alps. And then there's a more recent paper that suggests there is a slab all the way down everywhere. And so we're not really sure to what extent there's a long slab or short slab or no slab below the Alps, but also the age at which this uh, slab break off is supposed to have occurred varies between 55 million years ago and five million years ago, because we're trying, people are trying to accommodate, to accommodate different features that they see, either magnetism or rapid exhumation of rocks or, or other things like that. But it turns out that if you have a small subduction with a small slab, um, is a slab break off required? Not necessarily. And it could be that uh, there's not many, there's no necessary requirement for a slab break off. Anyway, so this, uh, just some conclusions. Subductions are diverse. The one size uh, fits all approach is unlikely to work. Um, and what's important is to understand the width of the subductible domain, what is subducted and the structure and composition of it. So the architecture of your oceanic or continental environment before subduction. And so subduction dynamics are likely to be very sensitive to the structure of the crust prior to the initiation of subduction. And so just because you have high pressure rocks doesn't imply that you have a long lived oceanic benefit type subduction. Uh, and it might not necessarily imply that you had a very deep subduction, maybe, but that's just to be controversial. Um, and the closure of basins and small oceans might well be enigmatic and uh, magnetism by itself might not be always uh, the best sort of tracer of convergence and closure of basins in different kinds of systems. So can the ALS be used as a preserved analog of a classical subduction zone system and be used sort of an example for what's happening in other areas? Uh, I'll leave it up to you. Okay. Um, oh, and just to make some publicity, uh, in 2021 in February, we'll have an Elements uh, magazine volume up on and the Alps, looking in more details at some of these, these ideas uh, with uh, Mar Mintner as well. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Lots of clapping can, can be seen from symbols in the uh, in the chat. So thank you very much for that. Let's pass on to ask questions. We wish to ask questions. If you uh, are unable to 
speak speak to them then put them in the chat uh otherwise uh, 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 to make it known you want to ask a question please use the raise your button in the participants we generally can't see all the video um, but, um let's do it that, that way <clears throat> anyone would like to ask a question of and So it's really true that no one wants to ask a question, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but so, so they just try and sort of start this off a little bit, a little bit, but I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to understand a bit when you do do the, I mean, you probably, probably know where I'm from. When you do, when you do calculations where you're, you're looking at the, the sort of, um, collision deduction and, and arguing about how the, uh, all of the material material be scraped off. To there to be you know so on. I mean, I mean, you know, my feeling is also that um, that the, that need to be three dimensional calculations, and I think you were mentioning that at the end, because uh, some part of the some part of the part of the zone zone well have no slab and is driven by a slab elsewhere. So um, of course I'm not sufficiently uh, sort of of okay with your reconstructions to be able to say if that applies there, but I guess it's worth asking you to comment on. Well, in, in, in the Alps, it is a problem because mo in most cases, we also, uh, let's see, we, we, we typically see this as a sort of you're rifting and then you're forming ultra slow spreading and then you're just colliding. But there is a lot of uh, rifting seems to have been, well, it was not orthogonal, uh, but uh, subduction was also highly oblique. So you seem to have an ultra slow and oblique system. Uh, and I don't have any reconstructions here, but uh, un unfortunately. But, but so yes, so there is a 3D uh, architecture uh, discussion here that, that goes in there. Uh, but to what extent that, I mean, um, yet yeah, there is, um, sorry, what was your question again? <laughs> I, I it it tailed off at the end. Well, I think what I was, I was just trying to, was just trying to sort of, sort of uh, tease out from you is, is sort of the ob observations uh, that, you know, the, the driving forces for, for the collision and, and and the sort of and what you see in they, they don't have to be exactly the, the same cross section and so when you draw a cross section that has you know some, some particular things are required for that it's not necessarily necessarily the case the force balance has to be sort of entirely from that cross section that you're observing and that it could be driven by some 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 slabs yes. that, you know sort of slightly over connected on the same colline plate or whatever yes and i, I didn't that was kind of it seemed like you were talking about the width being being important of things, but you showed some cross sections of numerical models, and I, I decided I would flag that as an opportunity to comment about things that I'm interested in. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> it's it's true that for a long time, um, uh, this, um, when you're looking at the opening and closure of the Alps, uh, different authors have wanted the Alps to be sort of their own little story, where you have your slab and slab rollback and slab break off, and everything sort of happens in their own little alpine environment. But it's interesting to see that the Alps and the Alpine uh, domain or Alpine Tethys seems to simply be an action or reaction to what's happening uh, in the Atlantic and the Neo Tethys. And they seem to be basically um, slowly rifting apart and separating because of the uh, opening of the Central Atlantic. And then you're just closing again with uh, subductions happening in the Neo Tethys. So, so the, the sort of really lateral things happening or it seems to have a strong influence in what's happening in the Alps. And then the Alps themselves are not really controlling their own uh, history. Okay, okay. there's a the questions in the chat. Um, <coughs> does it, do you want to ask those, those specific? I mean, uh, did you want to ask your question in real life? <laughs> or do you want me to read it out? Um, okay, other areas of the world where you see such similar structural settings. Well, that's a good question, and that <laughs> that's the one I have, um, because th there are a lot of very uh, of similarities between the Pyrenees and the Alps. But it would be nice to have to look at other areas where you could see that. Um, huh. And uh, I was wondering if I'm, I, 
I don't really know yet, but I'm, I'm, I've started to be interested in Southwest Pacific. And it, it turns out that the Southwest Pacific has a whole history of opening of small, small marginal basins, uh, embryonic oceans that open and close. And so I'm wondering if there would be, I'm, I'm curious about these areas and to see what there might be in terms of uh, closure of such systems. Um, but I, uh, if anyone has any particular ideas or it seems some peculiar features that seem to fit with this, this kind of idea, then please just send me an email. Uh, so for the moment, that's an open question. I, I'd like there to be more than simply two models being the Pyrenees and the Alps. <laughs> Okay, hey, uh, Ping asked a question. Great yeah. talk. That question. Um, does the subduction initi initiation in your case always happen at o OT? Oh, the, so, so in the case of the Alps and the Pyrenees, uh, it does seem that the ocean continent transition is a very weak uh, place where you can really accommodate your convergence and start your subduction. So in the case of the Alps and the, uh, and the Pyrenees, yes. But I think it also depends on the architecture of your of your transition between your continent and your ocean. Uh, I assume that the structure will be, the, the, whether or not it's weak will depend on uh, whether it's ultra slow spreading or if you suddenly have a very magmatic rich transition so that the rheology and the structure will be different. But, but I would assume that in the case of ultra slow spreading systems, the, the OCT is a very weak place where you could accommodate convergence. But just because it fits here, doesn't mean it fits everywhere. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm going to sort of, I just mentioned this out and we're running a little bit over time and that's Oops, just sorry about that. been a good and interesting conversation. So I, I haven't had any with that being this, but what I'm more conscious of is that we're cutting into some of the time that, that students and early career people might want to spend chatting with, with you and they don't want to, don't want to cut them off. So let me, let me formally say thank you on behalf of the rest of the, the, of the faculty. And I'm going to hand over to Vivoon, who will sort of, sort of negotiate the next part, which is where you get to the students if, if there's a little bit of time left over. over. And, uh, and to say thank you very, very much again. And then, then I'm, gonna, I'm just going to sign out. Yeah. And feel free to uh, send me or anyone.